On a cold and rainy night in the skies above America's Pacific Northwest, a hijacker clutching a $200,000 cash ransom jumps from a plane. More than four decades later, the crime has never been solved, and the infamous hijacker remains best known by the pseudonym D.B. Cooper. The legend of D.B. Cooper begins at the Northwest Orient Airlines flight counter at Portland International Airport on November 24, 1971. A man identifying himself as Dan Cooper pays cash for a one-way ticket on flight 305 to Seattle, a mere 30-minute journey. Cooper takes seat 18C at the back of the plane, lights a cigarette, and orders a bourbon and soda. Approximately one-third full, the Boeing 727 takes off on schedule at 2.50 p.m. When Cooper hands Florence Schaffner a note, the 23-year-old flight attendant assumes that yet another lonely businessman is giving her his phone number. But Cooper insists that Schaffner read the note. The message says Cooper has a bomb and the flight attendant should sit next to him. After opening his briefcase to give Schaffner a glimpse of the explosive device, Cooper lays out his demands. The Skyjacker wants $200,000 in cash, four parachutes, and a fuel truck on standby at the airport in Seattle. Schaffner goes to the cockpit to tell pilot William Scott that the plane is being hijacked. The pilot then informs the authorities on the ground and relays Cooper's demands. On her return, Schaffner finds Cooper wearing a pair of dark sunglasses. The plane circles in the air over Puget Sound near Seattle for around two hours, while the local police and FBI gather $10,020 bills bundled in rubber bands and procure four parachutes from a local skydiving school. On board the plane, Cooper points out the city of Tacoma below, indicating he may be familiar with the local area. According to Schaffner, Cooper remains calm and polite, even telling her to keep the change when he orders another bourbon and soda. The well-mannered man in seat 18C bears no resemblance to the stereotypical crazed skyjacker of the time, often political dissidents trying to get to Cuba. Witnesses describe Cooper as a man aged in his mid-40s, around six feet tall and smartly dressed. He is wearing a clip-on tie and mother-of-pearl tie pin, from which many years later, the FBI will build a possible DNA profile of the hijacker. At 5.39 p.m., the plane lands at Seattle-Tacoma Airport and parks in an isolated spot on the runway. A bag filled with cash and parachutes is delivered to the aircraft. In return, Cooper releases all 36 passengers, along with Schaffner and another flight attendant. Cooper asks for the plane to take off with the air stairs at the back lowered, but doesn't argue when airline officials say it's unsafe to do so. Instead, Cooper says he will lower the air stairs himself when the plane is back in the sky. When the plane takes off again around 7.40 p.m., there are only five people aboard. Captain Scott, his co-pilot, and a flight engineer sit in the cockpit. In the cabin, Cooper is joined by flight attendant Tina Mucklow. On Cooper's instructions, the plane is scheduled to stop in Reno, Nevada to refuel. Its ultimate destination is Mexico City. Cooper demands that the plane fly no higher than 10,000 feet and no faster than 100 knots, or about 120 miles per hour. Cooper also insists that the landing gear must remain deployed, the wing flaps lowered 15 degrees, and the cabin remain unpressurized. Out of Cooper's sight, the plane is followed by two F-106 fighter jets, scrambled from a nearby Air Force base. A Lockheed T-33 trainer jet also follows, but runs out of fuel and has to turn back. None of the pilots sees anything or anyone exit the Boeing 727. The last person to see Cooper is flight attendant Tina Mucklow when he tells her to join the rest of the crew in the cockpit. Mucklow will later tell investigators that she saw Cooper tying something around his waist. At 8.13 p.m., the crew notices a sudden upward tilt in the plane's tail section, which requires trimming to get the aircraft back to its flight level. Investigators believe this could be the moment D.B. Cooper made his exit by leaping into the freezing cold air, through the clouds, and to an unknown fate. Around two hours after Cooper's suspected jump, the plane lands in Reno, Nevada. Investigators search the plane, but the hijacker is nowhere to be found. A reporter erroneously identifies the suspect as D.B. Cooper, and the name sticks. On board, detectives find 66 unidentified fingerprints, two of the four parachutes, and Cooper's clip-on black tie and mother-of-pearl tie clip. The search for Cooper initially focuses on an area near the city of Ariel in southwest Washington state. But a huge manhunt turns up no trace of the hijacker or his equipment. According to FBI Special Agent Larry Carr, 
No experienced parachutist would have risked jumping in the treacherous conditions braved by Cooper. He says clouds blocked Cooper's visibility and the jump was uncoordinated, meaning he didn't have an accomplice waiting for him to land. What's more, a reserve chute picked by Cooper was only for training and had been sewn shut, something a true skydiver would have checked. In all the years that have followed, only two pieces of hard evidence have ever been found. In 1978, a hunter finds the fragment of a placard for lowering the back stairs of a Boeing 727. The placard was found along the flight path of the plane. Two years later, about 20 miles south of Ariel, a boy finds $5,800 in damaged cash from Cooper's Hall. Eight-year-old Brian Ingram recovers part of the ransom cash while vacationing with his family on the Columbia River. The discovery of the money leads some investigators to believe they were looking in the wrong place all along. The drainage area of the Washougal River becomes the focus of searches by private individuals and groups, but still turns up nothing. According to some investigators, the eruption of nearby Mount St. Helens in 1980 may have destroyed any remaining evidence. D.B. Cooper's daring raid led to a spate of copycat hijackings, including 15 alone in 1972. None of the hijackers succeeded. The case was also the kickstart for vast improvements in airline safety, including mandatory luggage searches at airports. The FBI has investigated more than a thousand suspects in the case, but has never been able to identify D.B. Cooper. DNA samples taken from Cooper's tie have never matched any of the suspects. However, the FBI admits the material may not have come from Cooper. The Bureau officially ended active investigation of the case in July 2016, citing a lack of new information. More than $194,000, the equivalent of more than a million dollars today, has never been recovered. The FBI suspects that D.B. Cooper didn't survive the jump, but their guess about what really happened is as good as yours or mine.